Sometimes you got to do things by faith. Amen? You never know who you may be praying for. You never know who that person may be. And I just want to encourage you, if you get, if you get a, a snapshot or a name, or especially if you wake up with it, you know, you never know, right, who God has assigned to you in that moment to, to stand the gap and to intercede for. He may reveal to you one day, he may not show you, but wherever they are, rest assured that that prayer, that prayer is helping. That prayer is, is an obedience to God. And, and that's what we're going to talk about being doers of the word of God. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. All right. Anybody know what this is? Talk to me. This is going to be an engaging one. I'm going to want you to talk to me throughout. What's this? It's uh, this one right here. <laughs> Silly. <laughs> what do we call this? A mirror. A beautiful mirror, right? What does a mirror do? Mix of my reflection, okay. All right, so I'm looking at my reflection and I see, what do I got? I got a little bit of lipstick on and I got some earrings, right? And I guess you call this a, a purple blazer, right? I, I'm, I'm noticing that. Anyone else looked in the mirror today? Anybody? No one looked in the mirror today? Yeah, okay. Do you remember what you have on? What you look like? Yeah. Today, yeah. <laughs> now, now, from from what I could see, I would say that the person I'm looking at uh, has uh, twists in her hair, and um, I would say she's of African descent. Yes. Okay. Now I put the mirror aside, and what if all of a sudden I say, you know, I feel Swedish today. Why is everyone laughing? You don't see a Swedish woman in front of you? I can feel it. Yeah. But what's, what's wrong? What if I say, you know, I, I'm wearing a, a black blazer? I'm not wearing a black blazer, am I? Yeah. What do you see? What, what would, I see strange looks on people's faces. What would you say to me if I said, okay, I have a black blazer, um, I have Swedish features? You say what? No, I don't, right? You would say, no, I don't. What would you say? That something happened between the mirror and what? Perception. Perception. All right. Hold that thought. Let's go to our opening scripture, the book of James. It says here in James chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at verse 22, and then we'll pray, and then we're going to dive in a bit more. James chapter 1, verse 22. Do I have a volunteer to read that verse for me? Please. There you go. Awesome. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Amen. Father God, I pray, Lord, that as it is written, that we would hear, truly hear, but also follow through and be doers of the word. Father, I pray that you remove all deception in the mighty name of Jesus, that we will see the truth that your word be activated in this moment and activated into our hearts in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right. It says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. It's interesting that the following says deceiving ourselves. What does it mean to be deceived? Talk to me. This is going to be an interactive. I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions. What does it mean to be deceived? Hmm? Tricked. Tricked. Okay. Tricked. What else? Fooling. Fooling ourselves. What else? Oh, con. Yeah, so we got tricked, fooling ourselves, con, right? Now, how do we con ourselves? I mean, if we're hearing something, isn't that not enough? The word seems to say to us that when we are only hearers, then we are missing so much so that we are actually fooling ourselves. 
We're conning ourselves, we're tricking ourselves, we're deceiving ourselves. It's like I could feel all sorts of things all I want, but when you look at me, it is what I described of what I saw in the mirror. Saying yes to God and no to the world. That's what God is trying to remind us here when he talks about following him, putting him first, walking in his way. That's what the word of God tells us to do. There's saying it, and then there's doing it. Two different things. There's talk and action. You hear that so many times, right? All talk and no what? And no action. What does that mean? That means that, okay, we hear a lot of stuff, but when we're going to see it, right? When we're going to actually see what you've been talking about. We talk about Jesus. We talk about being Christian. We talk about a lot of things. We sing songs about him. <laughs> Lord, we lift your name on high. We worship you. There's no other God but you. We may play the song and it's beautiful and, and it activates our emotions. We may even cry. And yet, in James, it says something interesting. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. He's not saying not to hear, but he says only, meaning if that's all you do, if that's all we, we are just talking, then we're deceiving ourselves. What's that but there for? <laughs> Let's take a fuller look at the book of James. So if you have Bibles or you could follow along, James chapter 1. Verse 21. And we're just going to get more of a context. By the way, whenever you see words like but or therefore, read full context. Go a few verses higher up and a little bit below. You're going to get more of a fuller context to understand what the writer or the speaker is saying. So I always like to read from the Bibles here. All right. So in, in chapter 1, verse 21, it says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Let me go up a little bit here. This word meekness, anybody know what weakness means? What does it mean to be meek? Anyone know? Take a guess. No wrong. Putting back yourself down. Mild. I like that word. Yeah. Yeah. Meek is, no, that's right. Like you're, you're mild, right? It's also kind of, I saw the body language, it's almost like you're taking a step back, you're putting someone forward. A lot of times people think meekness means weak, but it doesn't mean that at all, right? Meekness just means I could be in the front, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna step back. I'm gonna esteem you, right? I'm gonna put you ahead. I'm not gonna think myself above somebody else, right? I take more of a lowly place. Not in a, in a, in a sheepish way where I don't know who I am, but because I know who I am and because of who I belong to, and the gentleness is, the, is taking the, the area of, I want to put you forward, I want to encourage you, I'm going to be more meek, I'm gentle, mild, humble, right? He says, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of the wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. I love that word implanted. When you think about a plant, what are you doing? You're gonna plant the seed, you're gonna dig up that soil, you're gonna make sure that seed is deep and right and ready, but what do you do? You allow it to grow. You allow it to take root. Actually, what's happening, the seed is dying, <laughs> and then it takes root, right? But what happens in that moment is that as it's implanted and it grows, that's what the Word of God is meant to do. How do you know that the word of God has taken effect. Is it just talking about it? No. We begin to see fruit. Maybe not right away. 
maybe it starts off with a little bud, right? And that bud begins to make leaves, and those leaves, and the, the stalk begins to grow tall, and, and all of a sudden you see maybe some budding of flowers or, or a fruit. That's how you know. It becomes evident. And of that fruit, others enjoy, right? They get nourished. I really felt like the Lord brought this to my heart because so many times we have situations where we can sound really good. We can have the, the language. We can have the emotion. When we come into the house of God, it's wonderful, right? We are in his presence. But many times we, we come for various reasons. We see our friends, we see our family, we have good fellowship, we sing the songs. But what happens Monday to Saturday? What happens during the work day? Who are we then? James chapter 1. When, when he talks about not being doers of the word. He is reminding us it's important that we are coming to a place in him where we're completely willing to follow through with what he says for us to do. Amen. It is not enough to just to say we're a Christian. It is not enough to just to talk about him or talk about his word. It needs to be evident in our lives. Now, what do I mean by that? If you're in a relationship and you say to your loved one, you know I love you, but you never talk to them, never spend time with them, you don't call them, you're not there when they show up, <laughs> or if you are in the room, you're in one area and they're in another area, how long do you think that person's going to feel loved? Honestly, right? How long? <laughs> Two days. <laughs> Two days. <laughs> right? Eventually, what would begin to happen? There might be some questions. There might be some doubt to, well, how do you say you love me, but everything you do is the opposite? Or even more serious than that. What if you're around them all the time, so much so that it's obsessive? What if you are the kind that gets jealous of other people being around them and so you, you want to hold them back? Maybe you use your words and you say things with our mouths and we say, well, it's because I love you so much. <laughs> You're going to doubt that love, wouldn't you? In fact, you would say that's not love at all. And I don't want to try to trigger anyone or anything like that, but if we lay hands on somebody to the point where we're causing harm, that's not love. Why? Because the action doesn't match the word. Right? Don't be hearers only, deceiving ourselves. You know, Jesus had a conversation <laughs> with his disciple, and he said, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, Jesus, you know I love you. Tend to my sheep. Okay. Peter, do you love me? Yes, God, yes, God, yes, God, come on. You know I love you. Feed my lambs. A third time, Peter, do you love me? Can you imagine someone asking you, your son, your daughter, your loved one, asking you this question, and you've answered, and they come again and they ask you, you begin to feel like, why, why are they asking? It sounds like they're doubting my love. They know I love them. But Jesus was trying to get Peter to understand what that love looks like something. In other words, it's action. It's obedience. 
It's follow through. It's out of love for him, we're going to love his own. Amen. How can we say we love God and hate our brother? How can we say we love God and use our mouths against one another? How do we say we love God and we even, you know, in some cases hurt or fight? How is that being a doer of the word? (laughs) Saying and doing are two different things. It's one thing to say that we love God. It's another to actually do what he says. Love is action. Love is recognizing that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is owner. We've heard that preached many a times, right? He's ruler, which means, guess what? It's not a suggestion, (laughs) right? (laughs) It's not a suggestion. So many times we treat Christianity or, or or serving God as if, oh, I'll, just, I'll, I'll decide if I come to church. I'll decide if I love on that person. I'll decide if I read my Bible. I'll decide if I worship God. I'll, I'll decide what I, how I serve him or not. You know, I'll decide if I sing. I'll decide if I lift my hands up. <laughs> you ever gotten to a place where you're so excited and you're not even thinking anymore and you just shout because you're excited, right? You win an award. Or you see your favorite sports player, you know, they cross that finishing line. You're like, yeah! You know, you're excited. You're not thinking about, well, this is not very conservative, and I'm just going to have to, oh, I'm so glad that they crossed the line. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, good sports game. Yes, wonderful. Yeah. No, people are losing their minds (laughs) over their favorite player achieving that goal. And yet, we get timid. We get shy. We're like, well, you know, I I don't know. I I don't want anybody to see me. I don't want anybody to see me get emotional, too expressive. (laughs) Over a God who sent his only begotten son to take on what should have been me on that cross, and I'm going to be afraid to worship God? Be doers of the word not here as only. You know, when Peter was asked this question, not once, not twice, but three times, on the third time, it actually says that Peter was grieved. He's like, oh God, you, you, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus was trying to get him to understand love is action. Love is obedience. Love looks like something. We don't look at our brothers and our sisters in pain and walk away and say we love God. I want to jump ahead to, actually, let's look at Let's look at 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4, and then I'm going to look at chapter 5. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. Wonderful. We have it there. Okay. Do I have a volunteer to read this for us? Sure. And then we'll get to the next one. Yeah, go for it. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Wow. Who? A liar? Has anyone ever been called a liar before? Or how would, how would you feel if you're called a liar? <laughs> you come up to you and said, Do you love me? You liar. Sounds harsh, eh? The word of God convicts. The word of God challenges. When we see this, what do we say? It says, let God be true and every man a liar. 
when we say we are without sin. When we don't heed the word of God, the commandments, when it talks about commandments, it's talking about a divine rule. We hear a lot about kingship here in the kingdom of God. It is not a suggestion. It is a commandment. Right here, we hear our brother just read from 1 John chapter 2. It says, he who says, so let's make it personal, we who say we know God and yet not keep his commandments. The word does not sugarcoat anything. Straight up says liar. And the truth is not in him. Let's take a look at John, uh, 1 John chapter 5, so a few chapters down, verse 2. A sister, if you want to read that one, 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, or you can look in your Bible. 1 John chapter 5, verse 2. There we go. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. Amen. That's simple. Already might be thinking, well, gosh, like how am I going to live up to this? If that's your thought already, that, that's the enemy, let me tell you. <laughs> right? Because we can't do it. It's who? Christ that lives in us. It sounds burdensome and difficult if we're trying to do it in our own strength, if we're trying to be legalistic with it or religious with it or, or trying to rely on our own ability. Then, of course, it could feel discouraging. It could feel, well, how am I going to live up to this? You can't. <laughs> That's why Christ came, right? It is through Christ. It is by the Holy Spirit is by the leading of him and following in his ways, where you might not feel like doing something, but the love of God propels you. Amen. Amen. How many of you have children in this place? Or aunties or uncles? Yeah? Okay. You ever had someone, a child, maybe you're babysitting, or you're, you're at home with your child, and they wake you up, you're in that sweet, sweet sleep, that, that beautiful sleep, you're in that sweet spot, you know, like you're just sleeping and it's just the, the most comfortable. You got the, the right amount of cool air, the right amount of, of warmth, and you're feeling so comfortable and, and you're just in your dream world, eh? And here comes that child, mom, dad, auntie, <laughs> I'm hungry, right? What are you going to say? Go away? And you know your child hasn't eaten? Or do you get up from that sweet, comfortable spot? Why? Because you wanted to? No. Love woke you up. Amen? Love woke you up. You didn't, if you were thinking about yourself, you would stay in that comfortable. Maybe you just finally got to get that beautiful rest. But that child comes saying they're hungry. What do you do? You get up. You find something for, for that child to eat. Love woke you up. Love is what caused the response, the action. You might not have said, I love you. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Beautiful words means nothing when your child's hungry. Yes? So, again, we hear... By this we know we love, the we, we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. That is what the word of God says. I want to go back further to James chapter 1 again. Because you're probably wondering, what do I mean by this mirror? What does this have to do with anything? The Bible is so poetic. There's so many... Uh, metaphors and examples to help us understand what he's talking about, to really drive something home. James chapter 1, verse 21, I'll read this. It says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, 
not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Why? For, it says, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in what? In a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and what happens? Immediately forgets. Forgets what kind of man he was. Right? There's so many times we try to do things our own strength, our own ability, or we just talk the good talk, but we're never doing. You know, when teaching, they talk about using all senses, all different ways to learn things, not just hearing or seeing, but actually doing. Why? Because you're building what they call body memory or muscle memory, right? But here is talking about when we're looking in the mirror, we think, well, how can someone forget how they look like? <laughs> when we look through a natural mirror, we may forget, but it says, for he who observes himself goes away, immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But, verse 25, says this, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Amen. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. What I find interesting about when he says deceives, meaning there's some intentionality here. There's a choice here. There is a given into. Instead of looking at the truth and examining ourselves, you know, we take communion. You know, in 1 Corinthians 11, it talks about examining ourselves. We don't just take it loosely. We have to understand why we're taking it. I don't know why, why we're taking it, but to see if there's any areas that we need to repent, that we need to surrender, that we need to get right. Observe, examine ourselves. It's easy to point the finger on everybody else about what needs to get fixed. Because, you know, we're looking at ourselves and looking at other people. But when we look in the mirror, it's only for a moment. We may see that something is off and we can fix it while we're looking in the mirror. But when we walk away, it's all about whatever is in front of us. The perfect law of liberty, continuing in it, not a forgetful hearer, but what? Putting it to practice, actually doing what the word of God says. So the word of God say, go ye in all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. And if we're not, what does that mean? Now, it, people right away might think, well, I'm not an evangelist. It didn't say <laughs> be an office evangelist. Do the work of one, right? It could be anywhere. The grocery store, your workplace, you know, going for a stroll, right? Using every opportunity. It may not be a grand, you know, microphone and a, and a mic or, or a, a, a preacher podium or anything like that. It might just be that one person that stood out to you. It may be your neighbor. It may be someone you work with every day that has no idea that you're Christian. Hopefully they can see that you are, right? Because we're talking about not only saying, or speaking, or being a hearer only, but doing your actions, right? Something about us should look different from the world. He goes and says in verse 27, pure, undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. And again, he's, he's giving some examples. Visit the orphans the widows in trouble. Why was this? Because again, context, right? These were often shunned. They couldn't pay you back. <laughs> There's no Instagram <laughs> or Facebook for people to be like, yay, look at all those people preaching the gospel. None of that, right? It's simply 
between you and that person, and you're going out out of obedience to God. Be doers of the word. In a time of need, in a time of trouble, reaching out, connecting with somebody. And to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's the other piece there. As we're going out, as we're doing these different things, we are called to be unspotted from the world. You know, it's interesting when God's people was delivered from slavery and he was bringing them into a a new place or whenever he was sending people to the promised land of wherever that may be or receive some kind of victory or a, a land to be claimed for them. He says this in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 14. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 14. And if you have your Bibles, take a look. That You'll find that in the Old Testament. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 14, and the word says, you shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are all around you. There's something that struck me about this verse. Not only is he saying, don't follow after any other gods, he is acknowledging that there are other idols or other gods and other belief systems that is literally surrounding his people. So we can imagine the difficulty, like how do you live amongst them? How do you, how do you operate? How do you go about your day without being tainted, without being converted into, into a mixture or chasing after these other gods or bringing them into your home? He's acknowledging, hey, they, it's around you but you don't go after them. Being a hearer of the word only would mean that one would forget about this, and when something looked good, right, or sounded right, we may not know not to go after those things or apply those things into our lives. It says, you shall not go after them of these other gods that are surrounding you. What God asks of us to do In Matthew 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In other words, does he say, say, seek after these things and and pray along the way and and, and then maybe a little bit of worship? No. (laughs) In fact, he says, These things, whatever the things are that is good for you, he knows the things that are good for you and I. But he says, seek first the kingdom of God and righteousness. A lot of times we like to stop there, seek first the kingdom, but we forget the righteousness. You can't separate the two, (laughs) right? Can't separate the two. Why? Being righteous means what? Right with God. A relationship with him. Knowing him. How do we know him? We listen to him. We obey his commands. First John 5 verse 3 says, and forgive if I'm jumping around with fast, I'm just flowing right now. So first John 5 verse 3, it says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. This is the love of God. What strikes me about this, it says, and his commandments are not burdensome. And we think so many times we can get caught up in feeling burdened. (laughs) You know, there's things we want to do, right? And yet, here it's saying it's not burdensome. Why? Because it's the word of God that has the ability to transform. It is the Holy Spirit, our reliance on him. But yet again, if we try to do it in our own strength, if we say, God, I give you this, but not that. God, I'll I'll come here, but I won't go there, right? Then we're putting restrictions. But if we're saying, Lord, I surrender all. 
I surrender all, all to Jesus. I surrender, I surrender all. Might have missed a line there or so, but you know what I'm saying? Like we sing these songs and then you got to ask yourselves, have I really surrendered all? <laughs> truly. Have we truly surrendered all to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? Or is it just a beautiful hymn, a beautiful song we sing and it feels good and then we go home? And then we forget, and we, we yell at our spouses, we yell at our kids, we're not talking to this person, we're not talking to that person, I don't like you, and you know, we talk about our bosses, and we talk about our colleagues, and you know, we're not telling anybody about, about Jesus, and you know, we don't feel like worshiping today. And yet, I surrender all, <laughs> right? You see, when we kind of, lay it down like this. This is not, it's not a comforting message, I know. And this is sometimes where I get challenged. You know, we talk about walking in the prophetic. It's, it's easier if I were to come up here and I see the Lord, he's gonna give you a car, right? Oh, yes, you know, and, and yes, I see someone in, coming into your life and, and God's gonna ex expand your horizons and, and God's gonna prosper you and God's gonna do all this stuff. Whew. right? And yet we just read, he who says he knows me and does not keep my commandment is what? A liar. So if I'm coming up to you and I'm saying, God's going to do this, God's going to do that, what does that make me? <laughs> right? If you haven't yet surrendered to God, I'm not saying God won't bless and he can't cover and he can't do all these things. It's not bound by performance. Here, truly what I'm trying to say. If I see my brother, my sister is going in a way that is not honoring God, and you might get all the cars <laughs> and all the houses and all the promotion, and then when that trumpet sounds and we meet before him, my God, where would that car be then? Where would that promotion be then? Where were all the claps and the resounding and the, the cheering and the, and the sports team that we get all excited for and, and, and spend all our money on and, and all the clothes we buy? Whew, my God. The people of God was warned that when you go into this land, there are other religions, there are other gods, they're gonna surround you, but don't become like them. Don't become like them. So you say, okay, well, what do we do? <laughs> right, there's things I don't wanna do, but I still struggle with it. Okay, God's not saying that we're, we're not perfect within ourselves. What we do is we go before the Lord and say, God, I know this isn't of you. Forgive me, help me. Change my mind. Help me to have the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. This is, as Apostle likes to say, the Constitution. <laughs> Why? What does the Word of God say? I am a brand new creation. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So whatever that struggle may be, it may not be gone right away, it may not be gone tomorrow, but what we gotta do is we get back up and we cry on the Lord and we trust in the Lord and we keep working in him, we keep walking in him, we keep abiding in him. He says, abide in me and I will abide in you. Be not ashamed of me and I will not be ashamed of you. You see that relationship, it's, 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 it's this romance, this, this relationship, it's that connection Hallelujah. He says, I will not leave you as orphans, but what am I going to do? I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit as a helper, a counselor. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to remind you of the word. He's going to say to you, he's going to be, he's gonna be like, like a referee, right? You want to go here? He's like, no, 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 don't, don't go there. <laughs> Remember what Jesus told you 
right? That's not of me. That's of another religion. That's of another God. That's another, that's something else. You stay over here. You feel like you're ready to start running and God is saying, no, wait, wait, hang on. There's some stuff I want you to do. Imagine the apostles, the original apostles. When, when God said to them before he ascended, he says, I want you to wait in the upper room. He wants you to wait in Jerusalem before you go anywhere else. There's places I want to send you, but you wait for the promise. Whew. What promise? The Holy Spirit. And it wasn't until they became in one accord that what began to happen, it says almost like the appearance of fire, right? They were in one accord. And what happened? They began to speak in all diverse tongues. People thought they were drunk. So much for a conservative, dignified, <laughs> right? Because they emptied themselves. They waited on the Lord. And the Holy Spirit came. Imagine if they disobeyed. Imagine if they were only hearers but didn't do what Christ actually told them to do. Where would we be today? The entire New Testament, especially the, first, the five Gospels, <laughs> Right? Tells of Jesus and the rest is written by the apostles. Imagine where we be today had it not been for Jesus Christ and what he has done and the Holy Spirit that was sent to us. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else you need, whatever they may be, above and beyond what you could possibly think or imagine will be added to you. In hearing and doing, there's a warning, there's a caution. You might think, oh, there's more, TT? Yeah, there's more. <laughs> there's more. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to look at, we're going to look at verse, verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 4, we're looking at verse 3 to 5, wonderful. It says, <clears throat> for the time, say with me time, time, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching, say itching. Itching, itching what? Itching ears. <laughs> what happens? It says they're going to heap up for themselves what? Teachers. Wait a minute. What, what's happening here? <laughs> Isn't it good to teach? Isn't it good to learn? Isn't it good to have counsel? What is this time? that is being spoken about. Well, let's go back. Verse one, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Verse two, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Yes, he's talking to Timothy, but I would like to say to you, I believe he's talking to you and I today. Amen? It is a challenge. Why is saying pre... In fact, <laughs> there's an exclamation mark here, which means it's said with excitement. <laughs> it's said with an order, an authority, a passion, an urgency. Preach the word! I don't know if he said it like that, but if it, I probably would have said it like that. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Why? The answer comes in verse 3 that we just read. For the time will come. Brothers and sisters, if you look around, it's clear that time is now. 
every source of teaching and beliefs and self-help and whatever <laughs> guru and that teacher and that teacher and everyone wants to get, you know, a, a higher sense of self. No different than looking in the mirror and forgetting constantly needing to be taught, constantly needing to be told. And constant, now the, the biggest thing is healing. Everybody needs healing from trauma. Everybody needs something. And everyone, they just pick whoever. I don't know if they're licensed or what, but you know, everyone's just hoarding up for themselves. Teachers, this sounds good, and that sounds good, and I'll pick up that crystal, and I'll look into that art, and they call it art. That's another thing Westerners likes to say about everything that's from the east side. Oh, it's just, it's art. And yet, that's one of the things they sacrifice to. Come on now. Right? I remember, I won't say the place, but um, you know, I've traveled some places. And it was in businesses, and, and, and it's in Canada, by the way. I would see this. You know, People have it in their homes, have it in their workplaces. We call it art, right? High, the higher thinking or higher whatever. I'm spiritual. And they literally have a demon representative in their house and wondering why things are going wrong or in their workplace, right? It's become trendy now. Anyways, I digress. Coming back to this, it says the urgency is there. Why? Because there's going to be a time where people won't even pay attention anymore. Never mind doing, they're not even going to hear you. They're not even going to hear us. Right? Why? Because they want to hear things that's going to appease to them. And I, I find it interesting to use the word itching. You ever had like a really a, a bad scratch? You kind of get at it and it just feels, feels good, right? <laughs> get that itch. It feels good to heap up all these teachers. And yet, it says here, this is a, a warning. Verse 4, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to what? Fables. Make belief. You know, things that are just passed down, not based on anything, right? It feels good, so therefore it must be something I want to continue doing. Verse 5, but you be watchful. So I charge us as people of God, let us be watchful in all things, endure affliction. Listen, God did not promise there would not be hard times. In fact, he tells us that there will be. And then he says, take heart. Why? Because I've overcome the world. There may be troubles in the world. And there definitely are. So he doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't lie to us. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. He's not saying there won't be hard times. And yet he says his commandments are not burdensome. He says, those of us who are heavy laden, come. Come to him. Right? And he says, because my yoke, it is light and it is what? Easy. Now, if you know what a yoke is, you think about two oxen and they have the, the bar and they're yoked together. And, and so you might think, well, how is that easy? Well, you know, the, if it's walking and even, it's, it's, it's that weight is balanced. But in reality, it's Christ that's carrying all the weight. <laughs> he did it. He's just asking us, follow me. Follow him, right? Follow his ways. When he asks us to be watchful, he says, endure the affliction, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Some might say, well, I don't know what my ministry is. Well, I can tell you, every single one of us has a ministry of reconciliation, in pointing to God. It's not about some title. It's not about some big whatever brand. It is pointing to God. See, have that reconciliation, having the two come together, telling others about what Christ has done. Each of us have a testimony. There's no such thing, well, my testimony's like that person or is that person, and it's not very, it's not a big testimony. It's the right testimony for somebody. It's the right testimony for you. Be not only hearers, but doers of the word. Amen. You know, 
1 Samuel chapter 15. It says something interesting here. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse uh, 22. So Samuel said, has the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices and is obeying the voice of the Lord as obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Verse 23 says something interesting. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Whew. You know, I don't know how we would have survived in those days where, like, everything now in our world, everything offends us, right? We want everyone to talk very kind and gentle and whatever. He just flat out says, look, <laughs> rebellion is as witchcraft, straight up. He goes right into that. He says rebellion is as witchcraft. Stubbornness is an inequity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. He is talking to Saul who disobeyed, right? He did partial obedience. Today we're under the grace of God. But it says do not take advantage of the grace of God. The grace is given to us to give us the strength to say no to sin. That's what grace is really about. So all this like grace heavy message is not so that we can just continue living any way we want. It is to give us the strength. That's why he could say the commandments of God are not burdensome because the grace that God has given to us, the strength to say no to those things that are not of him and to call upon him and ask him for strength to say no to those, those things that are not of him. Obedience is better than sacrifice meaning he desires our yes and to follow through. In John 21, verse 17, this is where you will find about Peter and, and Jesus talking to each other about whether or not asking Peter, do you love me? And Peter's having to say three times. In Luke Chapter 6, verse 46 to 49, we're given another warning. He says, but why do you call me Lord and not do the things which I say? Remember, we have understood that Lord means what? Talk to me. What does Lord mean? Lord. Say it again. Owner. Owner. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, he wins the award. <laughs> right? Lord means owner. In other words, if we were to put that word owner, ruler, controller, but why do you call me owner of you? Why do you say that I rule the things in your life and you not do the things that I say? It's a fair question. It's almost like, why do you say you love me, but everything you do, you act outside of what is love? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show him. I will show you whom he is like. Verse 48, he is a man building a house, hear this well, who dug deep right? It's not surface level. He dug deep. Sometimes it takes a little time when you're going to dig deep. You got to get right to the core. So you want to be able to build something that's going to last. You got to dig deep. He says he dug deep and what does he do? He laid the foundation on rock, solid, unmovable, right? Before he starts doing anything else, before he starts building on anything, Make sure that there's a foundation. And what he's saying, the foundation is the word of God. The foundation is Jesus Christ, who he says he is. So he digs deep. 
He builds his foundation on rock. And when the flood arose, so life circumstances, when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against the house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. Whew. Amen. Hallelujah. In other words, no matter what life tries to bring, it's not saying you're not going to get shaken, right? I'm not going to shake this too much. This is very nice, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> right? You know, you don't want to shake it too much. But when life comes at you, it doesn't care what you've gone through. It doesn't care about your name. It doesn't care, you know, that you're having a hard day. Life just throws things to the young, to the old, <laughs> to the rich, to the poor. What's going to matter is the foundation. What's going to matter how deep we've dug. And not only being hearers of the word, but doers of the word. This is the example that the Lord gives us. He says, he who hears my sayings and does them, meaning not just say it, not just hear it, not just talk about it or sing about it, but does them. That person is like the one who built a house, dug deep, laid the foundation on the rock. That word vehemently is also referring to being ferocious, wild, argument. Does this sound a little familiar? If you look in Corinthians, what does it say about arguments, right? What are strongholds? They're arguments, right? Trying to contradict the word of God. So it's important. The only way that you can fight back is through what? The word of God, right? The weapons of our warfare are not? Amen. All right, see if you've been reading the scriptures, <laughs> right? Because when we rely on our own intellect, or our own ability, or all the teachers of the world, or whatever we can gather up for ourselves, I would liken it to be as this scripture talks about here. Coming down to verse 49. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without foundation. Can you imagine? How do you even build a house without a foundation? Any builders in here? Anybody builds or carpentry? Yeah, a couple of people. You ever been in a house without a foundation? Well, oh, yeah. Oh. What's that? Oh, whoa. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bet you didn't want to stay in that building too long. <laughs> You're like, I'm out of here. <laughs> right? You can, you, can, you can rebuild if there's a foundation and, and something gets broken, you just you replace that, right? Something might get a little bit shaken, you kind of put it back in place. But if the foundation is gone, <sighs> exactly. It's like a sandcastle. It may look pretty <laughs> from the outside, but you don't want to live in it, right? So he says, but he heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently or ferociously or arguably and immediately it did what? It fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Church, the Lord is really trying to drive something home for not just us, for, for all believers, for all our brothers and our sisters. And I, I really do believe the Lord has um, put upon my heart to, to the best of my ability, not my ability, but the best of my ability in obeying the Lord and walking in him and by his grace, rather, to remind myself, my family, the body of Christ, and join with others about the word of God and about getting ready, getting ready, ready for what? For his return. I believe it wholeheartedly. Our Lord is coming back. And in the meantime, we need to get ready. 
The time is at hand. Amen? Amen. Let's rise to our feet. And I want us to spend a little time in prayer. I don't know the different situations that you might be facing and what your walk has been like with the Lord. And, you know, this is not about, you know, condemning anybody. We all have something. It says we all fall short. And if it wasn't but by the grace of God, there go I. Right? So there's no pointing of the finger or thinking of that brother or that sister or like, oh, yeah, they haven't been in the church for a while or, oh, yeah, this has been going on. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> what we're going to do is have a personal examination of our own hearts, check our own spirit. I'm going to be doing the same. I mean, let's go before the Lord and, and whatever may arise. And if you want to close your eyes, you just bow your head softly and as I just kind of share, whatever may pop up, try not to fight it or resist it or excuse it or argue it. Just whatever it may be. It doesn't matter how small. Maybe it's something the Lord has asked of you to do and you just kind of been holding out on that for a little while for various reasons, fear, doubt, whatever it may be. Maybe there's something God is, is uh, trying to get you to let go of. But perhaps you're afraid, well, what am I going to do without that thing? Maybe it's a person he wants you to reach out, tell them about him. Maybe they've been praying and waiting and asking for help, but you know, no one's told them about Christ yet. And you're that person that the Lord wants to send. Perhaps it's someone who you had a falling out with. Now, reconciliation is something different, but he's just asking you, forgive them. Let it go. Right? Maybe it's you were too quick to judge somebody or too quick to have something to say and add that person's name on it only to find out it wasn't even true. Maybe it's God been showing you that, you know, you're doing too much. I need you to rest. Sometimes it's not about doing something. It, even, the do, even resting is doing something, right? Because that's obedience. Maybe it's uh, you're finding your identity in the ministry and you're getting lost in it. And God's saying, just can you come sit with me? You know, I don't know. Might be something. So, Father God, I just pray right now for each and every one of us that is here, that may be listening online and who are in this room. And, God, you know who those things are. Father, we know, Lord, your word says that godly sorrow, godly sorrow is what leads to repentance. And godly sorrow is stirred up by the kindness of God, your gentleness, your love. So, Father, I just pray for the kindness of God, the gentleness of God, the, the breath of God. Holy Spirit, breathe upon your people. Remind us of those things, whatever they may be. And I pray that in your embrace and in your presence, Lord, that you would call those things to mind. And help us, O oh God Almighty, to surrender, to yield, to obey. Help us, God, to not just be hearers of the word only, but doers of the word. Help us, God, that when we walk down the street, that people could see there's something different about us. That the light of God will shine through in our speech in our behavior, in our attitude. Father God, get us ready. Make us ready for your return. We pray this for ourselves, for our families, for our friends, for our loved one, for the body of Christ all over the world. Help us, God, to not just be hearers only. Help us to hear you. 
Help us to speak your word and help us to do it. In Jesus' mighty name. So we just take this moment of silence. And if there's something you feel like God's wanting you to repent for, all you have to do is say, Abba, my mighty God, I confess and I repent. Forgive me and help me to forgive myself and help me to forgive others and help me to follow through this time. In Jesus' name.